So who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Peter Michael Bauer, and I am the executive director of Rewell Portland. I'm also a basket weaver and a writer. What is Rewild Portland? Uh, Rewild Portland is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to promote cultural and environmental resilience through the education of earth-based arts, traditions, and technologies. It's kind of a lot of jumble for, you know, there's a bigger picture there, trying to cram it in as many words as possible. <laughs> What does it mean to be a rewilder or to rewild? Uh, <laughs> it's weird thinking about like what it what it means to be a rewilder because it means so many different things to so many different people. Um, to me, it's it's kind of like carrying a torch uh, for the next generation, keeping skills alive, um, but also kind of like pulling the line back from like the domestication that we've experienced and uh, oppression through civilization. So a return to a hunter-gatherer way of life in whatever form that's possible in our current predicament. Um, it's about acknowledging the barriers to that and kind of always trying to push the bounds. Um, What's the hoop and how does it relate to modern day society? Yeah, I think it's we can walk back up the, uh, the hoop refers to a way of life that is a seasonal migration from garden to garden uh, across the landscape. Um, and it really, I'm not sure if it relates to modern day life at all. Uh, <laughs> so, far, so far as to be a rewilder and to pull that line and try to return to a hunter-gatherer way of life, the hoop is kind of um, one model or part of a model of doing that. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily complete, but it's uh, as far as what, so that the hoop, it, there's the hoop theory. What is the hoop? That's the theory of the hoop. And then there's what are the hoop of like, you know, the people who are living on it, trying it out, trying to do it. And that's its own like hoop. So there's all these different individual hoops or people trying to do it. And then collectively there's like the bigger hoop. And then beyond that is like the theory of the hoop. Um, which is, to me, the more exciting part of rewilding is is like figuring out where I fit along the hoop because most of the stuff that's going on is out in Eastern Oregon or the dry side, and not a lot is happening here in the valley or the wet side. Um, and you know, one of the instigators of the hoop, Phoenicia, or one of the catalysts of, of the hoop, Phoenicia, uh, condemns all of us on the uh, on the wet side, saying that we're all screwed and we need to go out there and be with her. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to do that. This is my home. This is where I grew up. So I'm trying to figure out how to integrate it. Um, and of course, you know, uh, traditional cultures would have hoops within hoops within hoops that overlap. And so you're meeting people and cross pollination and all that kind of stuff. So I see that happening a little bit, but there's no real like defined hoop in the Portland area. And to me, that's sort of one of the things that Rewild Portland is trying to not necessarily be the, the creator of, but be another catalyst of so that people start doing that in this area, not necessarily through Rewild Portland, or that you know Rewild Portland isn't in control of the hoop on the wet side, but rather we're inspiring people to create it organically outside of an organization. It sounds kind of like, I keep thinking of the basket itself. Mm. Um, what does sense of place mean to you? Uh, a sense of place to me is, when you have a, a connection to your place and you feel like you belong. How do you see invasive species as a wildcrafter and a basket weaver? And what? As a basket weaver and wildcrafter? Um, <clears throat> I, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I have a hard time defining anything as an invasive species. I mean, I, I understand the ecological history and implications for wanting to do those things, kind of from both sides. Uh, there's, you know, arguments right now that like the idea of an invasive species is in and of itself kind of a Western concept, and so we need to, you know, there's there's people who are trying to deconstruct that and absorb invasive species into. Um, ecological systems and understand that maybe ecological systems aren't like this tight web that has to stay tight but is constantly in flux and things are working together and changing all the time and it's not necessarily a stable or 
intact thing always. So there's that argument kind of for, for invasive species. And then, of course, there's just the classic argument that they're disrupting their local ecology and uh, all that stuff. Uh, so <laughs> from my perspective, when I work with invasive species, I feel like I'm kind of in the middle of that argument because I'm working with English ivy, so I'm removing it from its place. So as far as the restoration side goes, you know, I'm doing what they think is should be done, which is removing it. But then on the other side, I'm actually building a relationship with a plant that's probably never going to be eradicated here and needs a, a relationship to people, which is the other side of, you know, acceptance of invasive species. So it's kind of this weird middle point where I'm able to kind of bridge those two things or, or just be in the middle of that change that's happening. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I like weaving with invasive species is because um, it, it has it has the benefits of all of those things without necessarily any of the negative side of either one. Mm. Now it is. And we're back. <laughs> um, what does responsible stewardship mean to you? How mm. is it done? What's the point? Responsible stewardship to me is that's a really hard question to answer. <laughs> um, there's so much there. I feel like there's like principles of responsible stewardship. Like there's just like one answer to that question. Um, obviously. The word itself, stewardship, I think carries with it a, a responsibility or, or the idea of being responsible for something. Because your stewardship means to take care of something, which is in and of itself a responsibility. So, um, stewardship is important because without, if you're not taking care of something, it's just going to go away. If you're not taking care of your body, you're going to get sick. Or you know, and if you if you see the land as an extension of your body, then obviously. Um, you want to take care of the land as well, and so I think uh, responsible stewardship is being able to see yourself and the land as one and the same, and be able to identify what the needs are of both your body and the land, and where that where that meets, um, and then figure out a way of actually putting it into action through some sort of reciprocity. I always come back to jays and acorns because um, jays, they can't bite, like, you know, everybody's like, oh, squirrels plant oak trees. That's not actually true. They do, but when a squirrel caches a nut, they bite off the germ so that the seed can't sprout. They don't do it 100% of the time, but the majority of the time that a squirrel, like, buries an acorn, they've bitten it off, so it won't actually grow into an oak tree. Whereas a jay, they just have this beak. They don't have the ability to bite the germ off. So jays and oak trees are like in the symbiotic relationship where jays cache oak seeds, acorns, <laughs> um, and they can't go back and get all of them or they leave some, and those do grow into oak trees. So jays are actually planting trees for the future generations of their, their offspring because it's not like the oak trees that they leave or plant or ever, you know, not, they're not going to live long enough to be getting acorns from that. But so there's this kind of reciprocity there. And um, we have this idea of animals as not conscious the way we are. So, you know, you hear that and you're like, oh, it's just the jay just forgot to go back and get that acorn. I'm not going to say one way or the other whether that's true or not, or if it's an accident on the jay's part. But just the idea that that's actually what's happening in that relationship between a, an animal and the thing that it's eating. Um, that that, that there's a way to eat something or kill something, but also to plant it back and uh, keep it keep it keep it living, keep it alive. So to me, that's the uh, responsible stewardship is that relationship of give and take, um, and in a very practical way. You know, there's like a lot of spiritual philosophy in this where people want to like 
well, I'm taking from this and I'm saying thank you and that's enough. And I don't believe that. I think that thank you is, is you obviously you say thank you, but then also there has to be some sort of practical thing that you're doing that's going to encourage the life of that thing. Whether that's like planting seeds or it, uh, it's a kind of plant that actually grows better when there's a disturbance. A lot of the root plants out in uh, on the hoop out in Eastern Oregon, they actually do a lot better after you've dug them up because you're creating these uh, pockets of loose soil that seeds blow into and then they're able to grow up a lot easier because the soil's been loosened um, and they get nice and big and fat and grow quickly and that kind of thing. So there's just like, there's aspects of, uh, of when you take something out of the earth that you're doing it in a way that another plant actually enjoys or, or it's something that the plants themselves like. Um, and to me that, that's the, the responsibility uh, responsible stewardship. <clears throat> well, I guess this kind of is part of that. As a basket weaver and rewilder, how do you relate to ecosystems of the Pacific Northwest and where do you see yourself in it? Is it kind of... Um, yeah, I... It's, it's difficult to... Uh, as a basket weaver and a rewilder living in the Pacific Northwest and being entrenched in civilization, um, it's difficult to reconcile that I don't really have a place in the ecosystem. I mean, my, my basket weaving is related in that I'm like having a connection to the ecosystem through basket weaving and through this kind of like side wild tending. But as long as I'm buying food from the store and like my subsistence is entirely based on industrial agriculture, I would say that my place in the ecosystem is just the same as anyone else, which is that we're destroying the planet through that process. Um, and the basket weaving thing is kind of like the, the playground with which the future is, is going to be. Or, or it, you know, you have to play around at something before you become a kid's playhouse and then they grow up and they, they run a house or whatever. And, you know, animals, baby, kittens and things like that, they, they play pouncing and then eventually they're actually doing that to kill things and get their food. And I, I think a lot of that with rewilding, like what is rewilding, how does it fit in the ecosystem? A lot of this stuff is just, we're playing with these ideas because as long as civilization is here, it's like keeping us from really going the full length. Um, and there's a lot of barriers there, obviously the population, the empire itself here, and legalities, privilege, some people have more access than others. Um, so uh, I, it's, it feels weird because I, I feel like I have a foot in both worlds in a sense, um, but really the one that's feeding me is this civilized one that's destroying the planet. And I'm reaching out to this other one and trying to figure out how to make that transition. Um, so I, yeah, I guess my place in the ecosystem is one of transition. And, but, but recognizing that I'm not free from that other system as well. Big bucket. <laughs> what does keystone species mean to you? Uh, I think keystone species is an idea in ecology where uh, it's an important species for maintaining an ecosystem. Are humans a keystone species or can they be? How so? Uh, I don't know. I think I, I keep steering away from the idea of a keystone species because I feel like it puts emphasis on like, like this animal is more important than the other ones because it does, it serves this role that, that meets the needs of all these other things. But I think there's way more going on there. I think everything that is alive has found a way of giving back to the thing that it takes in order to be alive. So everything is interwoven in this way that uh, I think keystone species is like, it's kind of a starting point to understand, oh, there are, there, there are ways in which we can manipulate the land in our own, just by being human, that affect the land in a good way or that are beneficial. And I absolutely think that humans can live on the planet in a beneficial way and in a way that promotes more biodiversity and more life than the way we're living right now. 
Can harvesting basket materials play a part in habitat restoration? Uh, well, I do that basically in my, you know, yeah, I think that harvesting invasive species in particular play a role in my, uh, in, in habitat restoration in my practice, mostly because that's how people perceive habitat restoration in the mainstream now is, is the removal of those plants. Uh, that's not necessarily what I think will end up being what how people perceive habitat restoration in the future, but right now, absolutely. If there is a need to do what you do, why aren't more people doing it? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, I, this is the the constant conversation, you know, that that we all have is what are the barriers to rewilding? What are the barriers to being on the hoop or um, any of that stuff? And I definitely think there is a need for more people to be doing this, and I don't. I mean, I, I, I'd say I don't really know why, but I do know why. There's hundreds of reasons. Um, I don't think there's any one in particular, but I think the central reason is that people uh, grow up inculcated in their culture and they have no idea uh, how to break out of that frame of mind. And I think the majority of people in this world are stuck in this frame of mind uh, in order for there to be a massive change where people do become more aware of the needs for these things, it has to be hyper immediate to their survival. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine calls it like the brown water effect. Like nobody's really gonna do anything about anything until they're like, turn on the faucet and brown water comes out. And they're like, oh God, uh, you know. Although, you know, even then you turn on your faucet and flames come out and now, just now there's finally states banning fracking like a decade or more later, you know. So, uh, <laughs> I think there's just massive barriers to that, legal barriers, there's, uh, you know, political barriers, there's financial barriers, um, education I think is a, is a large part of that because people have to know that there are other options available and then they have to kind of be convinced that those options might be better than the way that they're living and if they're sitting pretty in the United States and they're, you know, a privileged person then they probably won't be questioning any of this stuff and if those are the people that are in power that are kind of disseminating the ideas then of course the ideas are also going to be contained in this very small subculture um, can we effectively remove invasive species from local ecosystems through harvesting for through utilitarian edible medicinal uses instead of clear cutting them and and or spraying herbicides uh, I don't think that invasive species can be eradicated ever, if that's the goal. I think herbicides uh, stem from the idea that they need to be eradicated. Portland parks, for example, you go to their ivy poles and they're like, listen, we know that ivy is here to stay and there's nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. So we just pull it to maintain it. Um, I think that more people would be into the idea of pulling English ivy if they knew they could do something with it. There's this idea of altruism in like an ivy pull. It's like a lot of labor, you have to go out there, pull the ivy, and you just do it because it's the right thing to do and you're gonna feel good about it. But most people I don't think are just wanting to, to go do the right thing on the weekend and feel good about it. I think what they'd rather do is sleep in and watch TV and go on Facebook and maybe go out for some drinks and, and just rest on a weekend, you know? Um, and then there's people who, you know, I th so I think the idea of, of selling it for me was, you know, realizing that I could get people, more people out pulling ivy and if there was something to do with it. You know, I have people pay me <laughs> to, to go pull ivy. Like, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, part of it is the class, you know, in a sense they're paying for the, the educational aspect and the community and as a, as a school program. Uh, but if you think about it on that way, like, wow, you know, there's, people that are struggling to get volunteers to come and pull ivy, whereas I'm, I have, you know, I'm filling my ivy basket classes where people are paying me and part of the class is to go and pull the ivy. Um, it's really ironic. <laughs> I don't know if ironic is the right word. It's bizarre, maybe. <laughs> We're so wired for survival and money being... Absolutely. Money is wired into our survival yeah. parts. Yeah, and value. So if they're paying for it, then yeah. if we pay for something, then it's and increases our survival parts yeah. or something. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of idea that um, value is tied to 
money. You know, I've, I tried to, I had like a motor home and I tried to give it away for free for like three different times on Craigslist. And it was a great motor home, like, and nobody took it. And finally I was like, okay. And I put it on for $250 and I had eight people respond in less than an hour. Damn. So, you know, there's just this idea if something is free it's not or free. if it takes it's a thing, it's not really, it has no value. You know, it's not worth anything. But then as soon as you put like a price tag on something, oh, another example is I had a friend who put like a solo flex, one of those like workout machines in his front yard with a sign on it that said free. And it sat there for two weeks. And then he, he was like, huh. And he put a sign on it that said $25 and somebody stole it an hour later. So, you know, again, it's just, there's this perception of like, if it doesn't, you know, why is somebody trying to get rid of this? There's maybe some of that, like, oh, this must be broken, there, you know. And I think, it, I think it goes into the same idea of like volunteering for something or, you know, people want to get something out of it, I think, and not just necessarily the, the altruistic feeling of being happy because you did something good. Yeah. Like there's people on Duval at Mark Worth who are just like, they maintain the trails because they, they, they just, they do it. Yeah, but right. then there's like, you know, City of Olympia and it's like, they got to make all the posters, they got to pay their interns to make the posters and say, you'll get a free yeah. water bottle and a sticker yeah. and maybe get your picture taken with the city planner yeah. and like, it's crazy. And that really brings people out. But yeah. <laughs> um, is basketry for anyone, regardless of cultural background or modern day lifestyles, that might go against the grain of this craft? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think everybody has basket weaving in their in their in their ancestral lineage, and therefore basketry is for everyone. Um, I don't think that basketry is for everyone in the sense that a lot of people just might not like weaving. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I would never say that basketry is for everyone, but I'd say basketry is accessible to anyone who wants it or feels inspired. Um, but there are definitely particular styles and things that maybe shouldn't be copied or some things that are kind of, uh, intellectual property or cultural property in a sense, um, specific made American weaving, for example, is maybe not a great idea to to do that or sell it anyway. It's one thing to learn a technique from a native person or that kind of thing. It's another thing to kind of take that on and without permission or without learning from somebody. And I, there's a, there's definitely some issues in that. But I think that basket weaving in general is something that everybody has and had and all styles and all, all kind of patterns, not necessarily patterns, but um, definitely all styles of basket weaving are all found all over the world. What are some of the challenges of harvesting English ivy and Himalayan blackberry? Uh, the only challenge really in harvesting English ivy is that it has a, a chemical in it that causes a dermatological reaction. Um, other than that, you know, people want it to be rid of. So, you don't ever have to trespass, although I have trespassed to get ivy before. <laughs> it was real high quality ivy, all right? <laughs> um, uh, and uh, let's see. Yeah, you don't have to trespass or anything like that. You don't have to, you know, people will call you, oh, come get my ivy, I don't want it. So it's free, people want to get rid of it. You're helping out with uh, removal of it. And the only real danger uh, or, or barriers there are the chemicals that might be in it or like the things that are in the ground, you know. There's this weird thing too that I that I have a that makes me question the ecological implications of pulling ivy. And it's like when we pull up ivy, there's like tons of salamanders living in the soil there and you're like just ripping apart their homes. You know? And I'm always like, oh, I'm sorry. This is for the greater good, I think. That's what I've been told. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean you're 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 disrupting a system that is figuring itself out. And I don't know if that's good or bad, um, or what, or if it's, you know, mm. or nothing at all. Um, Himalayan blackberry is a little bit more challenging because it has prickles, um, not thorns. People say it has thorns. Botanical terms, it has prickles. Um, <laughs> it's also a very misunderstood plant. You know, it's called Himalayan blackberry. It's not from the Himalayas. It's not black, it's purple. 
and it's technically not a berry, I think it's called a droop cluster, um, and it has prickles, not thorns. <laughs> so, uh, but that, that's the one thing that makes it difficult, but if you just have a big thick pair of leather gloves, there's a secret to disengaging the prickles that makes it very, very easy. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's another thing where people want to get rid of it, and there are no challenges in getting at either one of those plants. <laughs> Yeah, I worked for WCC and I was constantly interrupting myself because I was like, salamander, salamander. Yeah, every time I swear we find at least one or two. And there's, there's insects that are burrowed in the ground too. Anyway. How can people with no direct connection or understanding of nature get involved? Hmm. I feel like if people have no direct connection, they might not be looking for it. So they might not want to get involved. <laughs> but if people do want to get involved, um, there's lots of opportunities. In Portland in particular, we have like a free class on the last Saturday of every month. And we go out and we table and we do a lot of outreach to get people to kind of come in. And that's sort of like our central, um, the doorway to the deeper stuff that we do. Um, and it's also a way of just like keeping the ideas flowing and creating community, having people come in and learn new stuff or cool stuff. And you know, we do like every year we have an acorn processing Skillshare in October or September. And uh, people come back to the same thing year after, even though they kind of learn how to do it, you know, it's just kind of a community oriented thing. And it'll grow from that also down the road to be something much more epic. Um, but I think that, I think people should, um, start more of these kind of community-based skills, Skillshare type things and bring people in that way. Um, and I've been trying to get more people to do those kinds of things for a long time. And again, it's difficult because there's lots of barriers to, to all kinds of things and not everybody's an organizer, you know? So, anyway. Of the invasive Invasive species, are there enough uses and variety of uses, and are there are they abundant enough to continue crafting with? Uh, yeah, I mean the English ivy and Himalayan blackberry are definitely abundant. There's no shortage. What was, this, what was the first part? Are there enough uses and variety of oh. uses with them? I don't know about the variety of uses. Um, it's it's awesome to be alive right now and see all the different people innovating uses and finding out things and like there's this real desire to to grow roots and connect to a place I think in, in these subcultures that are growing and I think you know it's nice for me to go oh I don't have to find a use for everything because I know all these other people are like have eyes on it too you know and I'm not an herbalist so I'm not looking for plant medicine I'm a weaver so I'm looking for things that I can make out of those things and, and play with those materials to craft things um, and it's great to meet other people who are doing that my friend Sharon Callis in Vancouver and Rebecca Graham in Vancouver BC they're both like invasive weavers and Matt Tommy who's an invasive weaver in North Carolina you know there's just like there's this desire to kind of connect with that and figure it out. Um, and it's just great to see like the different varieties of invasive species and what people are kind of doing in those places. Cause like we don't have kudzu here. And I was like, I wonder if you could do anything with kudzu. And I Google it and I find that there's this guy weaving baskets with it. And then our stories are like super parallel, you know, he's maybe like 10 years ahead of me in his career, but <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling now. <laughs> Hang on a sec. Okay. What about the use of native plants in comparison to the use of invasive plants? Why choose one or the, over the other? Mm. Uh, hmm. You know, initially it was kind of a selfish thing, honestly. <laughs> uh, I don't like paying for materials and I don't particularly like harvesting native plants, but also people don't want you to harvest native plants, you know. Like I call the city up and if I was like, hey, can I harvest a bunch of your native plants? They're gonna be like, no. <laughs> um, so initially there was some of that, you know, it was, it, uh, there's a benefit to invasive species in that people want to get rid of them. Um, and so that, that plays into my choice for that. Uh, 
another element is that I don't want to disrupt the native ecosystem, although do I want to disrupt the relationship, the new relationship that's being built, built between invasives and non-invasives? Because that's what's happening also. So I don't know, it's a, it's a catch-22 in some ways. I also avoid a lot of native plants just because um, oftentimes they're traditionally tied to Native American cultures in the craft that they do. And even though that's kind of a, um, it's generally acceptable for in, in weaving and crafting cultures for people to collaborate and work together and learn things from other cultures and be using those things, uh, I just generally avoid it because I don't want to uh, create any kind of friction in that regard. Um, I'll do weaving projects on my own, but not necessarily like, I wouldn't do a class or make a basket out of day materials and sell it or you know that kind of thing. Um, but also pollinators, I guess I should talk about that for a second. One of the reasons too of, of gathering uh, invasives versus native plants, and one of the whole reasons of this debate is that the native plants are also you know symbiotic with pollinators and other insects and things like that that, that are part of the ecosystem that rely on those plants. And invasive species that are coming here generally don't have that insect relationship. And so, again, that, that's sort of the friction that's caused between accepting invasive species as being here or trying to eradicate them. Um, eventually, they'll evolve to have insect collaborators or symbiotic relationships with insects, but it's going to take them a long time. And I think humans, we really want to, we're at this epic scale of, you know, there's seven billion of us. and we all have this idea that we want to interact with the land or that we should be the masters of it and we get to control what happens. Um, it's very anthropocentric, which is why they're calling this era the Anthropocene extinction. Um, so the idea of us going in and, you know, the idea is here because of us, but also the idea of us going in and deciding what plants get to live and what don't, it's, it's just not, I don't think it's on a scale that human culture really or a perception that even hunter-gatherers and our ancestors in that regard had at the same, the same kind of perception of that. So, I don't know. I, I, for now, it's, it, the safe thing to do is just pull the invasive species and not work much with the native plants, to just kind of see this conversation play out among experts or people that are invested in it and that can see sort of longer-term effects. And I'm not one of those people that's particularly looking at that, so. Um. In regards to pooling the and harvesting like in base uh, English ivy in particular, how do you do it without spreading the ivy while you're harvesting and preparing the materials? Because it it roots from so many different parts. Of the yeah, soil. yeah. In order to not spread ivy when you pull it, you really have to um, keep yourself in a contained area. You know, um, pulling up roots in particular, which is what I like to weave with. Uh, honestly, the spots where I weave, there's no concern about it coming back or spreading because it's just everywhere. Forest Park is just, you wa you're walking on ivy more or less the entire time in, in areas where I pull. So my concern isn't necessarily the spread of the ivy, it's the control. Um, so, you know, removing it from a base of a tree so that it takes five years off or saves five years of the tree's life kind of a thing, you know. Um, if we were to move, uh, we would definitely put things in like trash bags and then, uh, you know, once, sometimes we'll take the ivy down to like uh, a park area where there's like a concrete, you know, and we'll do the weaving on the concrete and then sweep it up afterwards, chop it up into little pieces so it'll dry out really fast and let it die that way. Um, but yeah, never transport it really unless it's um, contained. So. To weave with it though, I process it all on site and then put it in my trunk and take it to my house and then put it in my garage where it dries and dies. And then when I weave with it, I can I don't really care what I'm weaving to get clippings and things places because it's been long dead. So In historical or cultural context or both, how do you see basketry being an integral part of human connection to the local environment? I think basketry is an 
integral part of human connection to the local environment because it's something that we've all done. It's something that is nature-based. It's a way of interacting with nature with our hands. I mean, we're tool makers as part, not that we're the only tool making animal, but that that's something that's intrinsic to us. And we have opposable thumbs. And it's like when I'm weaving and I, my hands are moving, I just, it's just the world feels right. Everything is, everything is going the way it should be. And I think that that's part of my connection to that. Um, of course, they don't know how old basketry is. 40,000 years is the oldest we know that weaving was happening because of impressions on clay figurines that have been found. Um, and then there's like a 10,000 year old uh, Irish fishing basket that's been found. But other than that, it's really hard to um, trace material, perishable material culture, um, you know, made out of organic things and not stone. So we don't really know how old it is. So. Um, it's an interesting question of like how 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 long has human have humans been doing this or you know and, and what's that really connecting me to in the lineage of a few thousand years? It's an interesting way of looking at it, um, considering how long humans have been on this planet. Uh, but I really feel that it connects me here to my place, not because I have harvest sites, you know, or that I go to regularly where I'm removing ivy. And I'm building a relationship with that place. I'm seeing the native plants grow back where I've pulled the ivy. I'm seeing ivy kind of trickling back in and trying to keep it out or, or maybe just see what it's going to do. Um, so I'm having this relationship with this particular place over time. And my ivy baskets, you know, ivy is a highly perishable material. It's not durable the way like a willow basket would be. So I have to make baskets more regularly because they fall apart. So there's also this idea of like a lack of permanence, which I enjoy, uh, because then it keeps me going back to those sites and being connected with those sites and the plants um, themselves. And it makes me think of, you know, the first basket makers or the first peoples anywhere who come to a new place and learn a material. And we're in this age where there's just plants that have been scattered, humans that have been scattered, and we're all kind of trying to make sense of this, of what's happened, this explosion of civilization that's put us and all these other plants in different places and who are the people that are from here and what did they do for 10,000 years and can I ally with them to learn what you know how to live here sustainably and what can I do for them and what can I do for the plants that have been here and what can I do for the other people who are here and you know it's just sort of this weird smorgasbord of complexity of like how the hell are we dealing with this mess that we're in <laughs> and to me this is like the richest part of it um, the working with the hands, the connecting to it in a, in a real visceral way, not like, you know, I love um, sitting in places and meditating and feeling connected through that way, but there's just something different and, and grounding about working with the hands and actually producing, creating something with the hands um, that is just different than uh, anything else I guess I've experienced in trying to connect with a place. It's like this instead of Yeah, this. <laughs> yeah. But the hands love this too, that's why we're on it all day, right? <laughs> <laughs> They'll take anything they can get. <laughs> How can children get involved? Uh, kids love getting involved in anything in nature, really. I mean, it, it, we do a lot of kids programs through Rewild Portland, and kids like grinding acorns, they like pulling ivy, they like tying things together. There's a, an amount of dexterity and patience required to weave, so it's not necessarily something they're going to get, they're going to sit down and focus on and become bas master basket makers by age five. But obviously, there's, you know, uh, things that, uh, seeds that can be planted in kids, and then as they age and get better with working with their hands and more of an interest in what people are doing. But honestly, you know, there's this idea of like, oh, kids are losing touch with nature and what are we going to do about it? The reality is that adults have lost touch with nature, and that's why kids have lost touch. You know, the idea of no child left out, well, uh, no child left inside. You know, or um, we want to get kids outside. And it's like, well, the way to get kids outside is to get their parents outside, role modeling it. Children just are sponges for, as mirrors for what the culture is doing. And I feel like there's this a lot of responsibility being being kind of thrown onto kids or, or programs that need to be out there when parents themselves aren't necessarily taking the action of putting that into place. And that's, again, not necessarily their fault. There's lots of barriers to all of that stuff. But I think the biggest way to get kids involved in nature is to have their parents do it first, or to have that happening, you know? 
have their, you know, if you're a parent and you want your child to become a basket maker, then you have to become a basket maker, you know, and be working on it. Have them go, curiously, what are you working on? And be interested, or, or have, you know, uncles and aunts that are doing those things. And, um, yeah, I think that the, that's the best way to get kids doing stuff, is to have a culture of it happening around them all the time, and to not, like, send them away to a thing that's not connected to their immediate family life, because that's a disconnected, sort of abstract, it's not something that's necessarily integrated into the way of life. And so in order to make something more hard hitting, it needs to have a place in their daily life, not just something that they go away to. I went to the camp for a week and I did this program that is completely disconnected from my home life and what I'm doing in my school life and you know all the, the different sort of environments that, that we uh, are growing up in and being molded in. How can, uh, can I break? I'm good. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I might need to get some more water here in a sec. But we'll, Do you we'll want to pause? Yeah. <laughs> How might weaving our basket be a metaphor for life, or for unity and collaboration, for connecting with the earth? I feel like uh, it isn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wrote an essay once called "Weaving a Cultural Basket," and it was kind of this idea. But now I, I went like way too meta with it, and now I'm I'm like trying to real bring it back in and, and think about how to phrase it. Well. Can you read the question again? <laughs> it's kind of like three put together. Yeah. How might weaving a, or, or a basket be a metaphor for life, or for unity and collaboration, or for connecting with the earth? So weaving, um, weaving is definitely a, a metaphor for connecting with life and the earth and creating community, um, but it's literally how all life is held together. All life is held together with things that are tightly woven together. Um, you know, if you look at DNA, the double helix, it's a twined uh, strand, right? Which is the basis of twined basketry, or even making cordage. So literally, our, we, we, are, we are built by things that are, that are twined together. And, you know, uh, I think of the double helix, well, English Ivy's Latin name is Hedera Helix. So again, there's this overlap there of us being, you know, uh, this, this woven together that everything in life is, is woven. Even the things that we don't necessarily see through space, you know, there's, there's electricity, that there's all kinds of stuff um, happening there. And of course, then our relationships, you could look at it from that perspective, that our relationships are woven together, that we're people like weaving in and out of each other's lives and things like that. Um, so in a sense, it's not you know, a metaphor, it's just a reality that, that weaving is the way, it is how everything's held together. So when you're weaving something with a basket, it's like a reflection of what you are made of yourself. It's not a reflection, it is. It's the same thing. We're literally, <laughs> if you're twining a basket and you're doing that, that's what our DNA is. So, you know, there's this interesting, um, it's like micro and macro. You know, and the like biomimicry. It makes me think of all these different things of, uh, of, of physical states that flow and work together, and the twine is a as a great example of that. Um, so you know, there's this idea of like a cultural basket or a container, and things. Everything needs a container. Um, in in my mind. Everything uh, is a container within a container within a container. So, for example, if you don't have like, uh, and if you don't have a container for something, life can't happen. And um, uh, maybe an obvious example of this is a bird's nest. A bird weeds, it, weeds its nest together and lays the eggs in the nest. If a bird just laid an egg right on top of the tree, the egg falls down and is destroyed, right? So before it can lay an egg, it has to build the nest. 
of course, the egg shell in itself is a container. So you have this container containing the baby that's inside, and then the container of the sticks that is actually a woven container, and then you have the tree, which is the, con the container of the bird nest, and then the soil, which is the container of the, you know, you can go meta. You can also go down the other direction too, where like the egg had a, a container around it before it was laid, which was the bird. And then the bird has a container, which is made out of skin, which is woven together. And so you, you can just go in all these directions with it, you know, like there's so many layers to it. And so when I'm weaving a basket, I oftentimes will like think about this and think of it that it's literally an extension of myself, that when I'm weaving something together, my DNA that's woven together is now creating this other thing that is being woven together, but then it is also a container for something else, you know? Um, I think a lot in terms of fire, friction fire making too, you know? Uh, in order to build a, a friction fire set, you have to carve the, the notch, which is a container for the powder, and then you want to have a platform underneath it to, for that, that powder to fall on, so that's kind of a container for the powder to fall into. And that will create a spot for the coal, a container for the coal. And then you have a tinder bundle, which is like the container for the coal, or the, you know, once it goes in, then you blow the tinder bundle into flames and you've already built like your, your fire structure over here and have a little window in it. And then now that becomes the container for the tinder bundle. And there's just this progression of, of containers within containers, even the atmosphere of the planet, you know, is this giant thing containing us. But then of course the galaxy and blah, 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 blah. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, trying to like think about all of that stuff while I'm weaving and, and uh, just realizing the, the like interconnectedness of all of those things that are happening to just weave a simple basket, you know, and you're just making the strand of thing, but then it's, there's all these layers of connection that are happening that you may or may not even be aware of, you know, but when I think about those connections, that's sort of, um, that's what makes me feel the connection is by is, is by honoring it by thinking about it, um, and it's just kind of mind blowing, and having that sort of like awe while I'm weaving, and I like to weave the awe into the basket, um, you know, I like to have the the positive energy going into it, um, yeah. Do you see your needs as a human being, a basket weaver, an educator, being met with the needs of the environment and the earth in a symbiotic relationship? I think in a traditional culture, yeah. But, you know, I mean, it relates back to my relationship to the planet as a captive of civilization and how we're consuming from the grocery store. And that's not necessarily, that's not, definitely not a symbiotic relationship. So in theory, I would like to have that relationship, and I feel like that's what rewilding and hoop and those kinds of things are moving toward, um, but it's not a reality yet. So uh, it's the goal, and I do think that it is possible. I don't know if it will be possible in my lifetime. Um, I don't know if I will ever attain the ideal of how I want to have a symbiotic relationship, but I strive for that. And I think I, I think the basket weaving is is the element that keeps me grounded in that way. <laughs>